Hey, good morning, students. Uh, first up, check it out. Not even in daytime pajamas. Not bad, huh? Anyway, I hope you guys are all doing well. Um, what we're doing today is we're reviewing a little bit, and then we're also just taking a quick look at density. So let's get started with that. Uh, yeah, so we're going to investigate density and, how, and buoyancy and how it relates to continental plates. We're going to make sure that we're real clear on what's causing the tectonic plates to move. And then we're going to review the different features of different fault zones and other stuff, as well as what's happening in Earth's interior. So getting started, what is density? Density is how much mass you have in a certain space, in a certain volume. Uh, so I'll tell you guys a quick story. A long time back, I was getting a lifeguarding certification. And one of the things you had to do was you had to tread water for a half an hour with, it was like 25 pound weight or something like that. Um, you guys have probably done this before. It sucks. So it was a really big class, and the instructor ran out of weights to hand out. And of course, I was sitting one of the, holding one of these weights already. I'm like, oh, OK. So the instructor goes, and he finds that there's like 25-pound bags of flour or concrete or I forget what. And he starts handing out those out instead. And it wasn't the thing where you had to hold the weight above your head. You just had to hold it. And, and he gave those out. And I'm like, but, but, but. The 25 pounds on land isn't going to feel the same as in water because the big old bag of flour is going to displace a lot of water. There's a lower density. It's not going to have the same net downward force on the person swimming. I'm trying to explain this in like eighth grade or something. And the instructor is like, shut up. And I'm like, no, no, really. Like the 25 pound bag weight of flour is not at all the same as 25 pound lead brick. Like the lead brick, it's, it's going to sink. Come in, jump in and try it. And he's like, shut up. You get two bricks. And sure enough, like I had to tread water with two bricks instead of one. So lesson, lesson is there, um, yeah, just carry your brick. But OK, here's the point. Point is that when something takes up a ton of space, with the same amount of mass, it's got a lower density. So this is how like a hot air balloon. A hot air balloon weighs you know, a couple hundred pounds. Um, but it takes up so much space that its density is actually, on average, lower than air. And that's why it can float in air. So over here, we got the classic experiment where you take like three different liquids and you try to pour them in over a spoon um, very, very carefully. And you can get it all to layer with the densest one on the bottom, the lowest density on the top. Now, each of those three things looks like it's taking up about the same amount of volume. But what we know is that this one would have the highest mass for that same volume. This one would have the lowest mass for that same volume. Um, in college, at one time, I was able to get seven different colored layers into a glass that size. That was a pretty impressive trick. Um, anyway, uh, if we're doing mass divided by volume, some different ways we could measure this are kilograms per meter cubed. That would be like classic MKS physics style. The other thing we could do is grams per centimeter cubed. That's the one we use in chemistry, and this is actually the one we use most commonly in day-to-day -day stuff. So grams per centimeter cubed, or also grams per milliliter. Those end up being the exact same thing. That's fine. Uh, I've also seen kilograms per liter used. But bottom line is, it's mass over volume. Um, yep. And why do we care about density? Uh, higher densities sink, lower densities float. That's the bottom line. We're interested in what's the net force of each relative to each other using Archimedes' principle and buoyancy. All right, let's keep going. Um, so hopefully you can tell right away, well, if the densest thing sinks, that should have made it to the inner core. And the next set, densest thing would be in the outer core and so forth and so forth. We also mentioned early on in the unit that one of the reasons that the inside of the Earth is hot is because denser material is falling, lighter material is floating, and as those two things reverse places, it releases potential energy. I want you guys to think about me dropping the brick. I drop the brick, oh, potential energy turned into thermal energy in the long run. So as stuff falls, um, and, and this includes a low density and high density stuff reversing, um, that can release energy, and that's one of the three main reasons the inner core is hot. The other two reasons being radioactive decay of heavy elements like uranium and plutonium. Um, and then the third one is going to be a uh, phase change where the liquid, uh, iron and nickel, is very, very slowly turning into solid iron and nickel. So the inner core is expanding, the outer core is contracting as this line right here, this layer, gradually moves outward at about a millimeter a year. And if you guys think about this, um, do you get energy out of water to turn it into ice cubes? Or do you put energy into water to turn it into ice cubes? And the answer is we need to take the energy out. We need heat flow out of the water to convert it to ice. In this case, the outer core is doing the same thing. 
as it turns into a solid inner core. So phase change is the third main reason that the inner core is hot. Um, some trivial extra reasons are magnetic field collapse and uh, tidal heating from um, expansion and compression from the moon's gravitational field as it orbits us, but those are not the main ideas. Main ideas are phase change, uh, denser material falling and releasing its potential energy, and radioactive decay from heavy metals. All right, so anyway, let's keep going. What is the inner and outer core made of? It's mainly nickel and iron. However, the inner core is also going to have a whole bunch of heavier elements like platinum and gold. Um, it's got a heart of gold, you could say. Uh, and also things that are radioactive like thorium-232, my personal favorite, and then uh, uranium and plutonium. So, yep. All right. As we move out to the mantle, um, by the way, we want to clarify there is an inner mantle and an outer mantle. And the words for these are mesosphere and asthenosphere. Okay, so you guys are on the hook for these vocab here. Mesosphere is inner mantle. Asthenosphere is outer mantle. What's the difference? Isn't it all just one big mantle? Turns out there's a pretty big chemical difference right around this layer here. Um, but in general, these are going to be silicates. And lower down denser stuff is going to have a lot of um, iron and magnesium in it. Higher up, it's going to have more like aluminum in it. So there is a little bit of difference in, the, in those chemical layers here. Both of these are um, solid-ish, as is the crust. The name for the crust is lithosphere. Um, so all of these are solid-ish, but this one can move slowly. That's why we're calling it plastic. It's not entirely solid. It's just mostly solid. Um, we've got some depths here. You guys hopefully have already checked out the Unit 2 Handout 2 key and seen a, a bunch of depth information, as well as some pressure and a whole lot of temperature information. Um, one thing when we get to the, lith the lithosphere that's worth mentioning is the difference between basalt and granite. Um, so first up, the granite has a lower density than the basalt. So any of the tectonic plates that are mostly made of granite will float on top of the ones that are mostly made of basalt, which is why the continental plates can ride high up. Like, you know, if it's super, super floaty, it'll float higher in the water. Well, same thing is happening with our continental plates. They are floating higher up than our oceanic plates, which is why there's water on top of the ocean, but not on top of the continents. So hopefully that explains some stuff there. Uh, second thing, is that the continental plates and the granite are formed through intrusion, which means that the hot rock as it's pushed upward is melting its way into the crust and then possibly coming out as a volcano on top or just melting its way into the crust and then slowly, slowly cooling. And so that slow cool rate causes a bunch of weird features on the granite that you don't see in the basalt having to do with crystal size and other stuff. Um, the basalt is formed through extrusion. That means there's literally like a gap and it's flowing right in and then cooling off and hardening. Not that it's necessarily spilling out over under the top of the oceanic floor, um, but that it's at least making its way in pretty successfully before it cools off as those plates kind of diverge, um, divergent oceanic oceanic boundary, we know it makes a mid oceanic bridge. Okay, um, other stuff we need to measure or mention. Um, pressure is highest at the bottom, so is temperature. Those two things are fighting each other. Um, to determine the state of matter. Uh, one thing that's cool is that this plastic layer is hot enough that if it heads towards the surface, the drop in pressure is what actually allows it to turn into magma. So I want you guys to think of magma as plastic, not liquid, when it's under the higher pressure. Only when that pressure is released will it phase change into a liquid, the way you guys think about magma. Okay, other stuff. Um, S and P waves. We mentioned that P waves are primary, they get there first. S waves are secondary, they get there second. That means the P waves travel faster. The P waves are called longitudinal or compressional waves. They squish in the same way they head, parallel. Whereas with the S wave, they're gonna be more like, they squish up and down as they travel right left, that's perpendicular. So those are called transverse waves. And the S waves do not pass through liquid layers. So the S waves get stopped when they make it to the outer core, whereas the P waves can continue passing through the outer and inner core all the way to the other side of the Earth. This creates some cool shadow zones and is one of the main reasons we know about the differences in the Earth's interior. Also, there are some cool features right on the junctions between some of these layers, like one of them is called the Moho discontinuity. There's some cool like sudden transitions you can tell using earthquake waves to figure that out. So seismic waves help us know about the Earth's interior. All right, moving on. 
All right, now we're looking at features between different kinds of plates. So one thing we want to talk about is, well, what kind of faults are there in general? So we've got convergent. Convergent means coming together. We've got divergent, which means separating apart. We've got transform, which means sliding past each other. And then we've got passive, which means not moving at all. Uh, beyond those four categories, we can also look at whether it's a continental or oceanic or some combination of both types of plates involved. So things we should be noticing here. Um, well, when we've got divergent oceanic plates, we're going to get a mid-oceanic ridge. We're going to be building new oceanic floor. And the floor is going to be the youngest in the center of the ocean. And it's going to be the oldest at the edge right before it gets subducted under the continental plates or possibly even another oceanic plate. So ocean floor is youngest in the middle and oldest on the outside. Now, there's another thing happening, which is that the Earth's magnetic field isn't constant. It isn't permanent. It skitters around. Some textbooks say that it's not random. They are incorrect. It is a fully random time period for when the magnetic field reversals happen. Basically, what I'm saying is right now we got a North Pole and a South Pole, right? And it turns out they can actually like skitter around a whole bunch. That's called um, magnetic field wander. It's happening all the time. From, uh, it's actually getting faster right about now. So we think there's possibly a reversal coming up in our near future. And a reversal is when your North and South Poles almost entirely flip. Now, one thing to be clear on is that the interior of the Earth has many, many, many magnetic fields. They're not all lined up the same way. In fact, a bunch of them are canceling each other out. And it's only the net magnetic field that we're noticing from the outside. So there's a whole bunch of complicated stuff happening on the interior. It's not actually as well understood as people think. Um, there's a lot of confusion there among scientists. And uh, it's a pretty tricky math problem to solve. But um, bottom line is magnetic field is not a constant north to south. It flips around. Now, what's cool is iron and other magnetizable materials in the oceanic floor, when they turn solid, their orientation gets stuck. And so if it was a north to south field, you'll see all of the magnetic material in the ocean floor lined up a certain way. But if in a different time period, it was south to north, then you're going to see that oceanic floor lined up in the opposite way. And this creates magnetic field striping. There are actually stripes of different magnetic fields on all the ocean floors. Um, you can look in the Atlantic and you can look in the Pacific and you can see the same corresponding magnetic fields affecting both systems. So you can actually do what's called relative dating by comparing those different field stripes. And uh, it gets us a really good chronology of how fast the ocean floor has been spreading, um, as well as like being able to match up relative dating between different chunks of oceanic crust. So that's pretty cool. Something that's important to note is the magnetic field does affect the rock at the point when it transitions from liquid to solid. And then once it's in solid form, it's stuck that way. Um, by the way, which plate is older, oceanic or continental? And hopefully you're realizing that the oceanic plate is getting recycled in a convection cycle. So the oceanic plate is much, much younger than the continental plates. Um, continental plate is just sitting there floating as high as it can go. It's affected by all kinds of stuff like erosion. But in general, this is the one that's getting melted away. And then that material cycles back and eventually reforms. This is a very young plate compared to the continental ones. All right, now, I don't want to cover it in depth in this video, but I'm, I need you guys to understand the features of each of these different types of um, faults. So for example, oceanic, oceanic convergent is how I'd label this one. These two oceanic plates are headed together. I need you guys to know that there's going to be a trench, like the Marianas Trench, um, right where the subduction starts to happen. And that above the subduction zone, we're going to get a volcanic island arc. Um, and so like Japan or the Aleutian Islands or anywhere basically in the Pacific Rim of Fire would count. Uh, similarly, if we had two continental plates coming together, I need you guys to know that that's going to cause mountain uplift and that you're going to get some earthquakes right around there. There is no subduction happening there. They're both just being pushed upward and crushed together. And you're just piling up a ton of rock, which is why we end up with um, the Himalayas or a long, long, long time ago before erosion wore them down, the Appalachian Mountains. So please get really good using Unit 2 Handout 2 and identifying the features you could find at each different possible combination of plates. That's one reason I uploaded the key today, and there will definitely be a quiz question on that on Friday. All right, um, let's see, we already did density, right? Cool. Uh, on Wednesday, you guys are going to be doing a quick spreadsheet activity to make sure that you can, in fact, um, 
uh, calculate density if you need to and think about which one would float or not. It'd be real simple. Um, and normally we, in class, we'd go collect all the data. I'll try to upload some data for you pre-done so you, in case you don't have a, a scale at home or something like that. <laughs> all right. Um, let's play these videos here. Replay it too. All righty, play another one here. Okay, collectively, what was the point of those four videos? Hopefully you're noticing a couple things. First up is that the mid-oceanic ridge, the rock is still relatively hot and it's not layered on very thick yet. So that's floating. Um, it is less dense than the asthenosphere that it's riding over. As it heads towards the continental shelf or whatever shelf it's gonna be subducted under, um, it is cooling off, which is increasing its density. It's also having a lot more of that dense basaltic material added to the bottom of it. That is helping it sink. And that's allowing it to subduct. And when it subducts, it is the slab pull. This is the slab. It's the bent over dense part of the crust. Um, it's the slab pull that's doing most of the work causing that tectonic plate motion. So people used to think that a convection current in the mantle, in the classical sense, that loop-de-loo -loop symbol, was the thing causing the tectonic plate to move. Um, we now know that that's a small contributing factor, but that the vast majority of what's causing the plate to move is the slab pull. Um, this one right here, this. The slab pull is doing most of the work. We are also causing some forward pressure here at the mid-oceanic ridge but this is the thing that's causing it to move. We know that because the length of the slab is directly proportional to the speed of the tectonic plate. So we can tell that bigger slabs are causing more force, being able to drag that along at a higher velocity, despite drag, friction, all the other stuff that tends to slow things down. Okay, so slab pull is the reason that the tectonic plates move. That's what all of this was meant to illustrate. Hopefully you're also getting too that when material is hotter, it's expanded out, that lowers its density, allows it to float, as material gets cooler, its density increases, and that'll help allow it to sink. That's not even to mention the fact that we're adding on more and more of that heavy basalt-based material as the um, oceanic crust moves along. All right, uh, I'm gonna leave it here with a whole bunch of vocab. Hopefully you are clear on all of these. I wanna make sure you understand that there are two parts to the mantle, asthenosphere and mesosphere. Uh, and that the other name for crust is lithosphere. I would like you guys to be able to use these words on a quiz, should you have to. Um, I think we need a little bit more detail on the plate boundaries than just the vocab that's up here. So make sure you're referring to your handout and hopefully you guys are getting ready for Friday's quiz okay. Let me know if you need anything via email. I'll have office hours on both Wednesday and Friday this week. And as I mentioned in email, we're cutting back to only three lessons a week. Um, to kind of stay more in line with what's happening in all the other classes. Alrighty, hope you guys are having a good one. And uh, yeah, email me if you have any problems or questions.